I'm come, and I hope by thy good pleasure safely to arrive at home. Jesus sought me when a stranger, wandering from the fold of God, he to rescue. Gospel according to Mark, the seventh chapter. Glory to you, o Lord. Jesus set out and went away to the region of Tyre. He entered a house and did not want anyone to know where he that he was there. Yet he could not escape notice. A woman whose little daughter had an unclean spirit immediately heard about him, and she came and bowed down at his feet. Now the woman was a Gentile of Syrophoenician origin. She begged him to cast the demon out of her daughter. He said to her, Let the children be fed first, for it is not fair to take the children's food and throw it to the dogs. But she answered him, Sir, even the dogs under the table eat the children's crumbs. Then he said to her, For saying that, you may go. The demon has left your daughter. So she went home, found the child lying on the bed, and the demon gone. Then he returned from the region of Tyre and went by way of Sidon towards the Sea of Galilee in the region of Decapolis, they brought him to a deaf man who had an impediment in his speech, and they begged him to lay his hand on him. He took him aside in, profit, away from the crowd, in private, away from the crowd, and put his fingers into his ears. He spat and touched his tongue. Then looking up to heaven, he sighed and said, Ephatha, that is, be open. And immediately his ears were opened, his tongue was released, and he spoke plainly. Then Jesus ordered them to tell no one. But the more he ordered them, the more zealously they proclaimed it. They were astounded beyond measure, saying, He has done everything well. He even makes the deaf to hear and the mute to speak. The Gospel of the Lord. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Please be seated. Oh, I'd like you all to take a moment and see if you can find your pulse. Does everybody have a pulse beat now? You feel? I mean, you may have it in the wrist or up here. Everybody check it out, everybody. Anybody not have a pulse beat? This is good. It's good to know you're alive. It's good to know you're alive. It, uh, uh, as, as we do that, uh, uh, I'm reminded that this is the second week in which uh, the, the text, the reading of Scripture, last week we talked about how when you read Scripture, it's a dangerous thing because you just might encounter the living God between the words, over them, under them, somewhere in there, the living God might pop out at you. And, and for some, uh, at least in the Jewish tradition, in the Orthodox Jewish tradition, you better have your head covered. I, I notice, I think I'm, no, there's one other hat in the room. So she was okay. You're lucky you survived because as in the Jewish tradition, to encounter the living God without yourself appropriately covered is to die. Now it may be that you really didn't expect to encounter the living God in the reading of scripture. So it was, you know, just an expectation that don't worry that God isn't going to show up in the reading of this word. Now, you may have thought that, and there is a long tradition of people who live with that assumption that God won't be present among us. Right in the first reading from Isaiah 35, you have this, uh, 
the, these people who are in exile who, who truly believe that God has abandoned them because they were defeated and as human beings they became spoils of war in the loss to Nebuchadnezzar and Assyria and, and were snatched away and taken to, to, uh, uh, to that city, Babylon, where they were basically indentured servants or slaves or treated in that way. And clearly, uh, these people were not God's people. They didn't even worship God. They worshiped Baal. God wasn't present in that place in Babylonia. It wasn't part of the promised land. So why would they expect God to show up to them? But in these words of Isaiah, we have this declaration that comes that says, be strong, don't be afraid, do not fear. Here is your God or God, your God is here. He will come with a vengeance, with terrible recompense. He will come and save you. He is coming and going. He is here with you and you need to know that. You need to pay attention. But this thing of being in the wrong place with the wrong people comes up over again. It comes up in the gospel. Jesus, who's been in, in Gennesaret around the Sea of Galilee, and he's been preaching the coming of the kingdom and the call for a confession of, uh, for a baptism of repentance, the promise that God is really truly coming and, and will be with his people is on the one hand, generating enormous results in the popularity polls. People are coming from all over to hear what he has to say, and they're so eager for the healing touch that he can bring to the, to the sick and the paralyzed and the crippled that, 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 that they're just coming from all over, and he can't get a break as much as he tried to get away even walking some eight, 10 miles out of town. He couldn't get away so he went on vacation. He started, he started out walking to Tyre, a trip, uh, the region of Tyre and Sidon, a trip that to get to the, the port of Tyre would take, it's about 35 miles. It, but in those days, it would be kind of like going to Canada. He was leaving the promised land. He was going out from Galilee to the north and leaving all that behind in the hope that, that he could get a house and be in a place where nobody would recognize him. That was his hope, and he walked. They say it estimates the two, three days to go 35 miles walking. That's a pretty good trip. Uh, I was thinking about Leanne Hart, who's hiking the Appalachian Trail this weekend. Three days to go 30 miles or so. Sounds about right. But even there, as much as he wanted to be away, in this land where, where uh, Jehovah, Yahweh, Eloheinu, the names by which he would have called God, that God wasn't present because it was the land of Baal. It was a land where the people were not the people of God, and yet they, he was recognized. And yet this woman dared to come and knock on his door, knocked on his door and said, I've heard about you, I, 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 and my daughter is possessed by a demon. She's got a bad spirit. And, and I'm here to ask you, can you do what you've done for so many others by pulling that spirit out of her, withdrawing, healing her? Can you do that for my daughter? Now, we're all conditioned to the, to the Jesus that would say, well, of course I can. I'm glad to do that. But his reaction is probably like yours when you're on vacation. I'm on vacation, what are you doing? What are you doing here? Uh, you know, and, and, and it goes deeper than that, that, that uh, the bread is for the children, for the children of God. It's, it's not for the dogs. And the implication being that as a Syrophoenician woman, as one of the wrong people, that she was a dog. And a lot of people would turn around and leave at that point, but she, she puts the follow-up, she, she continues with them and says, yes, but even the dogs sit under the table to eat the crumbs that fall. And Jesus looks at her and has his aha moment. 
his moment where he recognizes in her something that is so authentic and driven that he says, go home for your daughter, the demon, the ill spirit, the bad spirit is no longer with your daughter. So it is, you can look at these stories and, and say, well, these are, the, the, does God, is God truly present with people who don't think that God belongs to be where they are right now? And Luke, or rather James, James goes on at length about the importance of acknowledging that God's present reaches out to everyone. Uh, in Luke, you find he starts out by saying, uh, James, I'm sorry, my brothers and sisters, do your acts of favoritism, and this word favoritism in Greek is one that could be translated as, as, um, as your acts of discrimination, your acts of preferential treatment, your acts. It's the same word that in Acts 10, the story of Cornelius and how Peter is called to go out. Peter, the, the Jewish apostle, is called to go to the home of this non-believer, this Italian. And in a vision that comes where God descends and tells him that that which God has made clean you shall not call unclean. And he goes into the home, into that home, and says, I know that God shows no preferential treatment toward anyone who fears the Lord. There is no preference. And James, in writing, he says, my brothers and sisters, will your acts of preferential treatment, setting one against another, is that really living in the faith? Is that faithful living? For if a person comes into your house and is wearing gold rings and has the Gino Armani suit on and the, the, the Italian shoes, the Italian leather shoes, and you look at them and you greet them, and the next person that comes in is not just a poor person, but is a beggar, an indigent person who's dressed in rags. And he says that, aren't you likely, aren't you, wouldn't your tendency to say to the person in the nice suit with the good shoes, oh, why don't you have a seat over here? And to the person who's the indigent, why don't you just uh, sit over there or sit it under my feet, literally under my footstool? Why don't you do that? And it, he writes and says that, have you not made distinctions? Have you not discriminated? Have you not shown your prejudices and your isms among yourselves and become judges with hurtful hearts, with hurtful thoughts, with evil thoughts? Haven't, isn't that what you're doing? He says or asks, you have dishonored these people. You've dishonored the poor. You've dishonored the Syrophoenician woman. You've dishonored the people of, well, you've dishonored people that you can put so many different labels on, men, women, gay, straight, black, white, Latino, immigrant, native. You've dishonored them when you make those preferential judgments that are seated in your isms and your prejudices. He says, you will do well if you really fulfill the royal law according to the scripture. You shall love your neighbor as yourself, but if you show partiality, you discriminate and you sin. So speak and act as those who are to be judged by the law of liberty. He said, you are free people. You are people who exercise discretion and judgment in your lives. You make choices about who you welcome to your home and whom you shut out, whom you embrace and who you push away. You freely exercise all that because God sets you free as people to exercise your choices and to make your own decisions. And that's important to note. And this text is so important as we remember all the things going in in our world today. Uh, yesterday at the National Book Fair, Diane Allen was talking about her book about the Declaration of Independence. And one of the comments that she made along the way that struck me is so true that we are so good at talking about liberty and freedom and so inadequate when it comes to talking about equality. And so as we read the news and, 
and you read about the reactions to the idea, the simple statement that black lives matter, and the reaction of at least some who are outraged by the elevation they seem to be claiming, that, 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 that somehow black lives have more importance in this moment than any other lives, but all it's really saying is, no, we want you to pay attention that in today's world that these lives have equal value as others. And for all her religious fervor, Kim Davis's choice that, that she, out of faithfulness seeming, out of her religious fervor says, no, I will not sign these marriage certificates because those people seemingly and out of my religious freedom, I can reject them and their applications. There is a tendency, even in, that, in the danger of our religious life, is that in this pursuit of religious freedom to impose or to judge and condemn and discriminate, saying that uh, those people are the wrong people and we are the right ones. No, pay attention to what James says. Pay attention to Jesus' example that even the dogs eat the crumbs that fall from the master's table, Jesus said, and he follows through and heals. Live by the law of righteousness and that law of righteousness that does not judge or condemn your neighbor. Follow the royal law that we should love one another, or as it's written here, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. These are rules for life, and they call upon us as matters of faith, works of faith, deeds of faith. So, James and Jesus, I think, would call us to go back and say, you know, if you feel your pulse beat, it's a sign that you're alive. Now, as Lutherans, we have this thing whereby faith alone counts. And I truly believe that by your faith, you shall live. Faith equips you to live. But you got to check the pulse beat. And if you can't feel the action, peristolic action, intentional action, actions of service, actions in which you judge people fairly and equally. If you can't feel that, is your faith really alive? I pray and hope that in this community, in your lives, that that pulse beat be strong and true, that the love of God can live through you in Jesus Christ. I pray that. Amen. Thank you.